everybody, and welcome to Tuesday. I hope you're having a good week so far. I know I am. Um, the, I keep learning more things. I keep learning more things about Rex Heuerman. And at first, when I was learning more things about Rex Heuerman, I thought they were sort of, okay, yeah, so ho-hum, if they're true, gross, horrible. We do murder all the time on this show, right? So it's not a surprise to me. But I'm learning more and more things. And even me, grizzled old crime reporter Ashley, I am, I am floored. I'm floored, I'm floored, I'm floored. And I cannot for a moment imagine what it was like for all those people working in his architecture firm. Because this was the guy they knew, Mr. Three-Piece Suit. Took selfies in the bathroom. Yeah, some people do that. Um, but what was it like to work with him? Did he show any signs? Any red flags? Was there anything looking back? So because I was dying to know, we called a couple of those employees, used to work with Rex Heerman, and two of them are on the show tonight. And they do have some things. <laughs> they have some things to say about what he was like, what kind of people he would hire only, and which people were afraid of him for what reason. Okay, that's all coming. And then we have another sneak peek into the relationship between Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie, her killer. And the reason we're getting another sneak peek so, so long after Gabby was, was, was killed is, is that the FBI has released more documents. And inside the documents is a, is a love letter from Gabby. She never expected anybody would see it, but it became part of the investigation. And there are things that she says to Brian that you could look at two ways. But knowing what we know now, there's only one way I look at them. I'm going to read those things for you in just a moment. And then um, in Missouri, there was just one person left, just, just one person left who could actually play God uh, for David Hosier. Because uh, David had his date and time set in stone for his execution. And I just want you to imagine for a moment you're sitting in a cell. I know you'll never be there, but I just want you to imagine for a moment you're sitting in a cell. And you're looking at the clock as it tick, 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 tick. 24 hours is all you have left. 24 hours. How would you look at that clock? What would you do with your 24 hours? What would you be thinking? Would you be afraid? So, like I said, there was only one person who could change all that. And it's this or it's this. So what do you suppose it was? That's coming your way in just a moment. When you learn something bad about somebody you know or you used to know, and I mean something really, really, really bad, it colors like every encounter you ever had with them. The behavior that just seemed weird, it now becomes sinister. And if the person was ever like a jerk, now they're kind of evil. The stuff we've been hearing for almost a year now about Rex Heuerman is as bad as it gets. And the latest heart-stopping details, Heuerman's alleged how-to manual for torturing, murdering, dismembering, and dumping the dozens of half-dozen uh, young women's remains, that suggests that all of the above can be true at the same time. You can be weird and sinister. You can be a jerk and evil. And I have to point out, as I do each time we update this story, that Rex Heuerman has not been convicted of anything. A jury, not me, not you, not the interwebs, uh, a jury is going to decide whether Rex Heuerman is sinister and evil. But the weirdness and the attitude, that verdict is in. And it comes from people who know Rex Heuerman, used to work with him back when he was a New York architect and... His alleged secret life was still very much a secret. You're going to meet two of Heuerman's former associates in just a moment. But first, I want to share another moment with Heuerman himself. It comes from that interview that we talked about last night. It was conducted in 2022 by a realtor named Antoine Amira. And that chilling comment that he made about how persuasive a hammer can be. Ooh. That was before he was accused of using tools to torture women in his basement. If you were a tool or an object to help you uh, in your, uh, to help you 
to bring your business to greater heights, what would it be? That's an interesting question. I know. <laughs> Because for what I do, we have to have so many tools in the toolbox. Uh, just one. Just one. Just one. Or an object. It doesn't have to be a tool. It can be an object. You know what? Hmm. I know. All right. One of the things I learned from my father was furniture building. Okay. He was an aerospace engineer and built satellites. <laughs> and Runs in the family, yeah? building <laughs> things. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> built furniture at home and I still build it in the same exact workshop so I have one tool that's pretty much used in almost every job and it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer Cabin oh okay and cabinets maker hammer okay it is persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something it not someone something <laughs> <laughs> and it always yields excellent results yeah. and at the end of the project whatever piece of furniture or what I'm working on it always helps it come out beautifully if you weren't watching last night uh, I had a full interview with Antoine and then he sat with me and we talked all about his impressions of Rex and he was so insightful So if you missed it, just go to uh, News Nation, our YouTube channel, and you'll, you'll see that interview. I really highly recommend you watch it. It's very, very insightful because there are very few of us who have sat across from him and had long conversations. But tell me that you don't hear that hammer talk differently, right, in light of this whole note to self that was allegedly from Huerman's planning document, right? Uh, so hit harder. Too many hit to take down. Consider a hit to the face or neck next time for takedown things to remember i am joined now by mary shell mary first worked with hewerman in 2007 while at an architecture firm that used hewerman as a consultant on building codes later she worked directly for rex at his company and she is now a journalist we're also joined by jeffrey st aramond he sells luxury real estate and once represented the seller of a property on which Hewerman worked as an architect. Thank you to both of you uh, for joining me. Um, Mary, let me start with you. What was your reaction to some of the horrors that we've been reading in the bail application, the details, the allegations that he was using a toolbox to torture women in the basement of his Long Island home? Uh, I, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, nauseating. Um, it's... Uh, Uh, causes anxiety. Um, I think um, at the same time, it's also remarkable. Um, most of the time, I feel like in these situations, we kind of have to guess what was going through somebody's mind or what actually happened. And, you know, it's incredible to see um, just an itemized list, a self-critique almost. It's really something Does it square at all, Mary, with the man you worked with? Like when you see these lists and this just sickening display of alleged torture, murder, dismemberment, dumping of real people, does it square with the guy you knew? Does it square with the Rex that you worked with? No, um, of course not. You know, um, however he... Um, However he was in his day-to-day -day professionally, uh, we never would have imagined that this is what he was out doing in his spare time while his wife was on vacation. At the same time, um, it's organized, it's thoughtful, um, it's got references to books and, and um, other killers. Um, so this is somebody who's detail-oriented, meticulous, um, I think it's quite believable and in line with his personality, in that sense. Jeffrey, did you ever notice if Rex treated the women around you differently in the workplace? Well, I wouldn't, I could speak to like my interaction with Rex um, and that was with my client and another colleague as we were trying to sell a property that he was the architect on. And um, it got a little contentious with him and, and the man initially. Um, and then at one point, because uh, there was so much confrontation between the two of them, um, 
my client that that knew Rex well and, and I had met Rex as well, um, she just he, he was becoming a completely different person is what she told me. Um, he was she was a little bit taken aback by how aggressive he was. Now, granted, you know, there was some complications with this transaction and kind of made it a little bit more of a challenge. But, you know, the fact that he wanted things done a certain way and if you um, didn't follow in line, he would, you know, um, let it be known that he was upset about it. And so just to go back to your previous question, looking at that, you know, all the details in the indictment and him being so meticulous, we got to remember, this is, you know, one of the top architects in the in the country, quite frankly. He's, you know, a uh, top commercial and residential um, architect. And if that's a microcosm of him wanting things done his way, I can see, and this may be a bit of a stretch now, but in retrospect, I can see him having, like, specific details on what to do to make sure that he doesn't leave any 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 evidence behind. So uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not surprised by that, to be honest. Did you ever have a weird feeling from him, Jeffrey, ever? Like just anything. Did anything stand out where it was just awkward, uncomfortable or um, unpleasant? Yeah, I would say that the interaction, because uh, we had to get some permits and I don't want to get too much into the minutia of like the whole real estate transaction, but we had to get some permits approved and, and he had to do extra work. And if anyone was questioning what he was doing, he made it, he, he was very upset about it. So much so to the point that I remember my client said, I'm not talking to Rex ever again. I'm done with Rex. Um, and, and it was that she thought was really odd, as well as the fact that, you know, when you're trying to sell a property, the likelihood of the architect wanting to purchase the property from the client, that never happens. And he was adamant about, I want to buy it. I want to buy it. And so now you could, you know, put a lot of different pieces together and, and maybe have some thoughts on what he could have been considering doing with the property. But nonetheless, that to both of us, uh, both my client and myself, that was a red flag. Like, why is this guy all of a sudden want to buy this property? Um, so that that was a little bit bizarre, a little bit bizarre. Mary, talk to me a little bit about the kinds of people he hired um, around the office. And, and certainly with the, you know, the perspective and the lens you look through now, whether things are starting to make a little more sense. Um, he, he certainly hired, um, a lot of women, most of the staff were women. Um, and I know myself, um, other colleagues, um, you know, we, it's like, we might be newer to the industry. We might've been younger and just having less professional experience. Um, and I think that that helped him maintain a certain power dynamic, you know, where he is. Um, training you, he's signing your paychecks, he's in charge, he's the boss. Um, and I, I'm sure it, uh, um, I'm sure that it really um, kind of inflated his ego as well. I think I read somewhere that he mostly staffed uh, women who were small, petite. Is that true? There were at least, um, uh, three or four of us that I would put in that category. Um, you know, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that was a thing. It was a it, thing. Well, I, I, in the documents, go ahead, go ahead, Jeffrey. All right. I'll just say this, that when we were ultimately about to close on this property, there was a, a, a woman that kind of fit that criteria. One of the attorneys, one of the, um, associates there, and she, she had to speak to Rex directly because he needed some some final payment that was done. And he was very, very aggressive. Um, and just to go back to your question about how did he treat men differently from women? And she was so uncomfortable that she did not want to be in the office alone when he came back to uh, pick up this 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 check. And so the the, the partner wow. of the firm was that's fine. I will be there. And then I guess he must have sensed something because Rex then came to their office with his with his daughter um, to maybe try to, you know, deflate the tension that was there. But it was very it was a very odd feeling from from her. And she communicated that to me directly. And now in retrospect, she, she told me that. Yeah. Fascinating. I mean, certainly fascinating. The documents that uh, were filed with the court suggested that he wanted petite, smaller women, easier to manhandle, maneuver and maybe knock out Mary. One thing that has sort of stuck with me, I can't get my head around it, and maybe with your wisdom you can help solve this. 
The documents are riddled with the most childish spelling mistakes. I mean, heavy, H-E-V-E-Y. Um, torture, T-O-U-R-T-U-R-E. I mean, just all sorts of really bad, destroyed, D-I-S-T-R-O-Y. And there are multiple times where they're spelled like this. Uh, organized. I mean, look at it, he can't even read organized. Was he like this in the office? Did he, was he a terrible speller? Does this look like his handiwork? No. Um, I think the most likely explanation for that is that he may have been using a, um, a speech transcription software, um, perhaps an early version that was around, I think, as early as, um, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. So I think that that's probably what that is. Um, but there's no way that he himself um, would have had that kind of error uh, riddled. I, you know, he's a, he is a very, um, per his per his former um, employees, he is uh, meticulous, well-spoken. Um, he wouldn't tolerate even looking at something like that. Um, he wouldn't write something up like that. That is fascinating because I have also wondered if this is his work, if he was just writing quickly and was excited and um, didn't correct you know, the mistakes on the fly. But uh, to both of you have been so helpful. Mary Shell and Jeffrey St. Aramon, thank you so much for being on. I think I'm going to call you again as we begin to you know, get even deeper insight into who this person is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So we have heard what he said and we've heard what he read and what he allegedly wrote. But when it comes to knowing the real Rex Huerman, there is another way that might work even better. We can look at Huerman's movements and his mannerisms, his hands, and his tone back when all of his alleged murders were still known only to him. An up-close look at Huerman's body language, what it tells us about him when we come back. So if what the prosecutors are saying about Rex Huerman is true, and that has not yet been proven, and it can't be assumed either, be careful about that. But if it is, he mastered not only the dark art of murder, but also of deceit. He kept his inner serial killer hidden from the world, but nobody can hide from everything, from everybody, all the time. If our words don't give us away, our body language certainly might. Consider again uh, Rex's Q&A, in 2022, and that chilling comment about using a hammer to be persuasive one year before his arrest. I'm sorry, but I, I just can't shake it. One of the things I learned from my father was furniture building. Okay. He was an aerospace engineer and built satellites. <laughs> and Runs in the family, yeah, building <laughs> things. <laughs> and <laughs> built furniture at home. And I still build it in the same exact workshop. So I have one tool that's pretty much used in almost every job, and it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. Can we, oh, okay, and cabinet maker hammer. Okay. It is persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something. It, Not someone. Something. <laughs> and it always yields excellent results. Yeah. And at the end of the project, whatever piece of furniture or what I'm working on, it always helps it come out beautifully. What I'm working on, coming out beautiful. All this brings me to our friend Scott Rouse, a behavior and body language expert who trained alongside the FBI, the Secret Service, and U.S. military intelligence. He co-hosts a podcast called The Behavior Panel. Scott, great to have you on again. Thank you. Okay, what do you see? in those uh, sound bites. Well, let's keep in mind we're seeing a, a, a clinical narcissist. I'm under the impression the guy's a psychopath from what he's done in his history. But we're seeing the clinical narcissist in the best place he could possibly be. It's heaven for him because he got, he's got someone asking him questions about himself. And as he answers these questions, we see all kinds of cues that let us know that his confidence is way up. It's through the roof, just like a clinical narcissist should be. We're seeing, it, as he speaks, we see the head go back, which shows his arrogance, and the chin comes out as it goes back. We see a lot of that under, underneath his chin there, which is 
which is actually a pretty big deal. And then we see his fingers, they're, they're adapting and, and moving around with excitement as he starts to talk about himself. He does this, and we see him get excited. He pulls these together. We're also seeing two thumbs up as he's talking. When our thumbs are up, that lets everyone know that we're feeling confident. When the thumbs go away, confidence is very low. When they're up they're, and they're out and everybody can see them, they're really high. Same thing with steepling. You're going to see him steeple in here as well when he talks for a second. When he starts talking about himself. This is the uh, nirvana for a narcissist. Put it on a pedestal, being asked questions, and being on camera. At the same time, let me add one more thing. I know I'm going long on this one. But watch him check the camera. No, but I want them talking. to keep rolling the pictures. Wait, Scott, I want to just tell our control room, keep rolling the pictures, because every time you were saying something, I was looking at his fingers. So I'm gripping now oh, okay. uh, on this. So go ahead. There's keep the going. steepling. Yeah, there was a steepling. And now he's got his hands are like this. And these, these illustrators he's using are showing his bravado, this really big, these really big illustrators that he's using. So we're seeing a narcissist on a pedestal being asked questions, but watch him check the camera every now and then. He sort of checks it, and he looks right down the barrel. You can't see him. It, it takes a second to get to, to see him do it, but you can see him checking it. He's totally into this situation. He absolutely loves it. Now, keep in mind, as he goes through this, he's done all these horrible things, or he's done a lot of the horrible things, supposedly, allegedly. Allegedly. Done these horrible things. I have to keep saying yeah, allegedly. allegedly. Yep, yep. Done these horrible mm-hmm. things. And as he feels confident because he's under the impression he's gotten away with all that. And he's so smart, nobody can catch him. And we'll hear him as we go through these uh, videos as well. We're hearing him talk about how much smarter he is than the city that he works for. Because he, he tells them what their problems are. And he tells them how to fix them. He does everything that a clinical narcissist will do. I mean, it, it's, it's mind-blowing, all the things we're seeing in here and all the things he's saying. When he talks about his father... He's talking about how smart his, and brilliant his father was, too. He's to, and, as, and, and the, the uh, interviewer goes back and says something about, you know, oh, you're, it runs in the family or gen- genetic or whatever. Same thing. It's just one thing after the other. It's just a, um, a, just a pile of, of narcissistic comments and body language that let us know exactly what we're it's, looking at there. You doesn't, know, doesn't say we can it, tell it's interesting you say this. I'll tell you, mm-hmm. right, and I'll tell you something. We, it, it's important to say that, um, but I'll tell you that Antoine Amira, who who did this interview, that's him right there, uh, the, mm-hmm. the real estate. And again, he's laughing because this is just an architect. He's not interviewing a serial killer. He's interviewing an architect, so of course he should laugh. Right. Um, he said it was the worst interview he'd ever done because of the ego, the just unabashed ego of this man. He said he just was unpleasant. Uh, because it was so over overbearing, and and Nikki Brass is a former escort, who also talked mm-hmm. to us about going on a date with Rex Hearman in 2015. She says he discussed serial killers, and then he really changed his tune when he started talking about the Gilgo Beach murders. Let me play that soundbite. Take a look. Okay. He leaned in. He got excited. It seemed like something he like very much wanted to talk about, um, but not like not even just talk about. You know, look in someone's eyes when they're remembering something, when they're thinking about it, when they're trying to think about details. It was like that. It wasn't like somebody who read a book and was just spewing facts. It was somebody who was trying to act like they didn't live it. Wow. About 40 seconds left, but Nikki Roush saw the body language. What did you see? Or what did you, you make yeah, of what she saw? All right, exactly what... Every woman, woman sees. Women take in information a lot, uh, in a lot more detail than men do, and they can siphon through it much quicker and see what's happening. What she's talking about is the inner dialogue she sees going on in his head. The reason he's excited is because they're talking about his favorite subject, something he got away with, these murders that he did. The only thing psychopaths, if he is a psychopath, I don't know for sure, but I'm under the impression he is, when they um, murder someone, that's only some of the real excitement they get because of the adrenaline rush. And he's talking to her about the most exciting thing he's got going in his life. As he's talking to uh, someone who has the same job that she does. And uh, that's exciting yeah. for him as well. Because he's probably thinking, am I going to off her as well? So she's very lucky. Oh, very Lord. lucky. Well, you know, she's she so lucky because she got such a bad feeling. It, yeah, no kidding. She said no to his advances. No, I won't come back to your place. And no, I won't take a ride in your car. And she said, I, I got to go. I, I got a friend who ABC. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott Rouse says, always, I love what you say. I want to spend a whole hour um, on all the creepy weirdos uh, and get you to analyze. Thank you for this. 
Oh, thank okay, you so good. Much. Well, I'll call. <laughs> You're going to regret that. All right, still to come, folks. Um, the words of Gabby Petito, buried in a big pile of evidence and never made public until now. It's a love letter to the man who would eventually take her life. Why was Gabby pleading with Brian Laundrie to stop crying and to stop calling me names? End quote. Was it an innocent quarrel or a red flag that Gabby was barreling towards her own demise at his hands? You're going to hear that letter next. Every single time we get a new detail about the senseless killing of Gabby Petito by that guy, boyfriend, fiance, Brian Laundry, uh, it just feels like ripping a scab off, right? And today is one of those days. In that massive file of investigative documents the FBI has now made public, um, we found a handwritten love letter from Gabby to Brian. It was written before the couple set out on that trip of a lifetime. Uh, from which Gabby never, of course, returned. And it was clearly meant for Brian's eyes only. Gabby writes this, quote, Brian, you know how much I love you. So, and I'm writing this with love. Just please stop crying and stop calling me names because we're a team and I'm here with you. I'm always going to have your back. She goes on to say, quote, you in pain is killing me. I'm not trying to be negative, but I'm frustrated. There's not more I can do, end quote. Again, Gabby wrote those words on paper. She didn't say them on the phone or dash them off in a text. She wanted Brian Laundrie to actually hold that letter in his hands. That's how meaningful she was. Brian Enton is News Nation's senior national correspondent, arguably knows more about this story than anyone so, Brian, you know, I was looking at this and thinking, look, if this was a, a love letter between any other couple, you might not think anything of it. But knowing what we know now, it just speaks volumes. It does. And I think we all were left um, just wanting more clues about what happened between Brian and Gabby. We didn't really um, get a resolution to the whole thing. And so every time we get a little more information or a little more evidence from the FBI, uh, we just we just look for anything that we can find, and I think the way you described it, almost like ripping off a scab. It, it, it's true. This was a 350-page document dump from the FBI that came down. Some of it, much of it, was just sad. All the pictures from inside the van and Gabby's belonging and her shoes and her notebooks and all her personal items. But this letter, I think, is what uh, stood out the most, and it, it just showed uh, that that the relationship was in trouble. That it was an abusive relationship. Uh, and that it had been had been that way for quite some time. Is there some like context that you can give to to this particular letter? So it's not dated, Ashley, which is important. So we're not exactly sure when it was written, but it appears that it was written uh, before the road trip, before they went off on that adventure in the van, um, because she mentions getting back from New York. So that's the best that I can tell is that it's before they went on the road trip. I want to read you another part of the letter, though, that I found interesting, Ash. Um, Gabby writes, sorry I got upset over a dumb piece of paper, but I just wanted to do this with you. You really know it's all your fault because you're into all this cool stuff I was sheltered from. And and she added on the next page, now stop crying and come home uh, and say you love me with a big hug. Uh, and it's just, again, it goes back to the fact that now we know this, this relationship was abusive. And it, it seems like she was, in a sense, almost trying to, to, calm, uh, to calm Brian down. So, so weird, because we don't know where was he that he had to come home. And if she's writing him, is she going to mail the letter? Uh, is he staying somewhere long enough, far away? It's just all it sort of gives us more questions, I think, than, than answers. Um, Not too long ago, we actually, from the FBI filings, we got pictures that Brian had scribbled in a a journal, and there was like repetitive sketches of the the words, trust no one, and kill. Was there anything else that jumped out from his writings with the FBI? 
Yeah, those sketches were certainly disturbing. And there's another sketch that's now come out from the FBI with this latest batch of evidence that we were able to get. Uh, and it's this drawing. There was, there was this sketchbook that they were able to get from in the van. And in it was this drawing, which we haven't seen until now. And we believe this is uh, a drawing by Brian Laundrie. And, and it appears to be Gabby Petito's hands because if you look closely, you can see Let It Be tattooed on the arm, which we know... Gabby had that tattoo. And it's just sort of a strange drawing. I was just looking at it really closely. I mean, there's roses, there's a milkshake. Um, you know, we know that Gabby apparently liked milkshakes, but there's also like bills floating around. Um, and it, it's hard to decipher exactly what he's trying to portray there. But again, I think it's just another one of the mysteries, something we'll never know. We'll never get the answers to these questions. These are just sort of like more clues of what was happening behind the scenes. But is that him facing her? Like, I can see what looks like hands at the top of the picture. It looks like he's facing her. I'm not sure if I'm interpreting it right. Maybe across a table or something. Yeah, it, it, it does sort of look like that, or like that hand is holding something at the top there. That's also another, I think that could also be another drawing, because it, it was a sketchbook. So you've got this drawing uh, on one side, and then that's sort of like the seam yep. of the book, and that may be another drawing. But again, it's, it's hard to tell, because even the quality isn't that good it's with weird. the FBI. Yeah. Shockingly, the cameras from but the also, FBI, you can't even see it that well. Shocking. It just sort of looks like it matches up with a body in an arm position. But yeah, it's just, again, so many more questions, but at least... We're desperate to get some kind of answer to that very sad tragedy. Hey, Brian Enton, thank you. I appreciate you bringing that. Thanks, Ashley. All right, still to come, I can't, I can't imagine it. I, I, like how, I don't know how I would cope watching every single minute ticking away, knowing that they are the last precious minutes that I have left to breathe. Is it sadistic if you enjoy hearing that? If it's happening to somebody who is a criminal? Or is it justice and it feels good? Because half of our states punish criminals with the death penalty. And what do you suppose happened to this double murderer, David Hosier, in his last 24 hours before go time? That's next. Way. Coligard is a one-of-a-kind way to screen for colon cancer that's effective and non-invasive. It's for people 45 plus at average risk, not high risk. False positive and negative results may occur. Ask your provider for me, Coligard. For 24 hours, the countdown clock was ticking for David Hosier. It's really hard to know if he got a wink of sleep last night. Because, like, after all, if you knew that you only had 24 hours left to live, would you sleep all night long? That countdown clock was taken away to Hozier's own execution. So those last 24 hours must have been hell. But sympathy will be hard to come by for Hozier. He was a condemned double murderer. And the state of Missouri put a needle in his arm because of it. At 6 p.m. Central tonight, they let the deadly drugs start flowing. And he was dead by 6-11. Hozier was the seventh person executed in the U.S. this year and the second in Missouri. He was convicted of murdering Angela Gilpin and her husband, Rodney Gilpin, back in 2009. Hozier had been having an affair with Angela while she was separated from Rodney. But according to the police, he flew into a jealous rage when Angela went back to her husband. And so he murdered them both. Back to that haunting 24-hour clock. Yesterday, Missouri's governor, Mike Parson, denied Hozier's request for clemency, citing in part Hozier's lack of remorse. Two weeks ago, Hozier actually spoke with this show and our producer, Chris Maloney. And during the conversation, he continued to claim his innocence. Here's some of what he said. And I know you've filed several appeals, and I've, I've tried to follow your case as best as I can. And I, I was just wondering, do you still man, maintain that you're innocent of what you're in prison for? And not only do I maintain it, I am innocent. I was not in Jefferson City. I was not in Cole County. I'm not. I was in the state of Missouri at the time that Angela and Rodney Gilpin were killed. I'm no angel. But there are enough women out there, just like there are enough men, that are looking for 
friends with benefits. That you don't get upset just because one decides to go back to her husband or one decides to break it off with you. There's, I, I don't want to sound crass and I don't want, but it's, one particular is not worth doing that over. I've been married and divorced three times. All three of my ex-wives are still alive. Now, setting your own case aside, you know, what, what do you think about the death penalty? Do you think that there are people who should die for their crimes? Had you asked me 18 years ago or 15 years ago, I believed in the death penalty. But having seen what the prosecution has done in my case, and having talked to other inmates and seen the way the prosecution and prosecutors have violated constitutional and uh, civil rights and the laws to get convictions, I can't say I actually do believe in it anymore. If, if you are executed on um, June 11th, have you thought to yourself of what last words or message you would want to leave before you die? Well, I am hoping that if I can get out to the public the type of things that the prosecutor and the judge pulled in my case to convict me wrongfully of a crime, if the people see... Would they be able to look at it and go, is this the way I would want to be treated? Well, David Hosier did actually leave a written statement right before he was executed, and it wasn't that. It was actually a Bible passage. Here it is. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Uh, Righteousness, maybe not so much. The prosecutor said the evidence against Hozier was overwhelming, and it was a jury of his peers that agreed on a death sentence. Uh, Reverend Jeff Hood was Hozier's spiritual advisor and was with him when he took his last breath, and he joins me live now. It's good to have you back on the show, Jeff. Thank you for doing this. So what, was the, what were those last moments like? Uh, sort of describe everything. Who was there? Who was watching? Uh, what was it like, you know, for uh, the condemned David Hozier? Yeah, thank you, Ashley, as always, for having me. You know, it's a, it's a very strange moment, um, you know, to sit there and talk to someone that you've talked to for, for months and months and to, to watch them slowly fade away. Um, you know, you, you, it, like I said, it's just strange. And Missouri has a particularly unique setup in that um, all of its... the walls inside of the chamber are um, basically mirrors. I mean, they're one-sided panes of glass, but they're mirrors. And so uh, me and David were the only people in the room. And so I'm sitting in a chair next to him, talking to him, reading scripture and whatnot. And the only thing that I can see is my reflection in all of these different uh, windows. And so that's, you know, very unique. No other state that I've been in um, ha- has been like that. And so it was, uh, it was bizarre. It felt like I was in, you know, just a, a haunted house, a hall of mirrors. A looking and, glass, uh, yeah. It was Weird. very, it was um, yes. I only have like a 45 seconds left, but uh, what was he saying? Like, was he, was he terrified? Was he crying? Was he scared? Half the country will hope he was terrified. Half the country will be appalled that, that it happened at all. What, what was it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to de- uh, disappoint either side, but he was, certainly, uh, he was certainly anxious, but at the same time, he was, was confident. He was hopeful. Um, you know, there's a lot that is uh, complicated about this case. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You've illustrated that. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's my job to bring love to that very difficult moment. And uh, I, I hope that he felt love. 
I don't know what there is to be hopeful for, though, when you're, you know, strapped to that gurney and that needle is in your arm. There's nothing left. Um, such an incredible job you do, uh, Reverend Hood. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for giving us the color. I think we're going to have you back because I think you're going to be doing more of these. Thank you for this. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Bye-bye. Uh, Reverend Jeff Hood, again, spiritual advisor. He's been to many. He'll be to many more. Coming up next, the mysterious disappearance and death of Riley Strain. Months after his body surfaced in the Cumberland River, still so many questions. Like, did someone slip drugs into his drink, causing him to lose his way? The official toxicology report is in, and we have it. You'll hear it next. It was supposed to be one of the best nights of Riley Strain's life, but it ended up a nightmare from which his parents cannot wake up. Three months ago, Riley and some of his fraternity brothers from the University of Missouri went to Nashville for a big weekend. As you know, Riley went missing the night of March 8th, and two weeks later, his body was found in the Cumberland River, several miles downstream. Um, having his body back... Uh, that's one thing, right? And that's it's a big thing. But having answers as to what happened that night, that's quite another. And sadly, a brand new toxicology report contains precious few answers. Because no drugs were present in Riley's system. No signs that he was roofied. Nor were there signs that he was a victim of any kind of crime. The police maintain that Riley drowned accidentally. And though the full autopsy report is still not public, his family has ordered a private autopsy and a separate investigation. And we asked our friend Joseph Scott Morgan, certified death investigator, whether the two weeks that Riley was in the water could have compromised the toxicology reports. And the answer was a short one, no. He says traces of the drugs would still be present. So for now, it seems that the mystery of Riley strain just continues, which is very, very sad. For everybody who really felt for him and his family, but really it's so sad for the family. Speaking of family and friends, tomorrow, if you can believe it, it is 30 years since the murder of OJ's ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. 30 years. Kato Kalin was there that night. Kato Kalin will be here tomorrow night. Do not miss it. Cuomo's next. 